All right, cool. Am I on? Is it going? All right. Because I flipped it on earlier so the buzzing would quit and make sure that's going. So did you throw that first slide up? What we've been talking about next level Christianity. Go into that next level. Because again, if we don't match the intensity that's coming at us, you're dead meat. We really are. You know, today starts with college basketball, March Madness, and you're going to have some 16 um, spot rated teams beating number ones. Because number ones are going to go in taking 16 for granted. And then 16 is going to step up their game. And guess what? You're going to see some big upsets probably today and tomorrow, however the schedule goes, because of that. So we need to have that same kind of attitude in the day in which we live. I say it every week, but every week we get closer to the end times. Every week, you know, honestly, you've got to get this in your head. The end of the book will happen. It's going to occur. And there will be people on the earth when it occurs. Now, if you're banking on that thing, I'm going to get flying out of here before that happens. I don't know if you want to bank on that. Because as, as I looked all through the Old Testament and stuff, a lot of people got their heads lopped off and died for the faith. You know, somebody even wrote a little book called Fox's Book of Martyrs. You know, so I don't know why you're thinking you're so special, you're going to fly and everything's going to be cool, and all these people had to suffer. Jesus suffered. So again, you might just want to kind of rethink that. But understand, God's given us all these tools in our tool belt to walk out our faith victoriously being an overcomer. That doesn't mean you won't have any issues. I don't know why people think they won't have any issues. Why, we've become in so lazy and so cowardly. I actually heard somebody say, or I read somewhere, that if the United States was a Ukraine and another country invaded us, we'd give it up within a couple of weeks. There is no appetite to stand up and fight for freedom. I saw another thing that was like, I really wanted to repost it. It said, all you folks standing up for the Ukraine right now, where were you when your coworkers were losing their jobs over mass mandates? Oh, yeah, it's real easy to stand up for somebody when it doesn't cost you nothing. But where were you back then? See, that's what I mean. We, we, we all become, we're big and all puffed up behind that keyboard, ain't we? Until you see the person face to face and then really got to deal with the situation. So, again, this is where I'm kind of coming from. I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just trying to really convey to you where I'm coming from in these things, this is what's going to happen down the road, and unless you're preparing now, unless you're going through and upping your game now, understanding you in the playoff time, you ain't going to make it. The devil is out still killing folk. You don't need to be on his list. Well, you're on his list, but you don't need to succumb to that. Because he's out to steal, kill, and destroy. So again, we want to up our game concerning all these things we've been sharing. Last week was with the Holy Spirit. That's why, like I was saying earlier this morning, we're to stir them up. We've got to understand the power. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Well, if that is true and you truly have a revelation of that, why are you always wiped out? If greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You're always wiped out because you don't have a revelation of that. You need a revelational understanding of that truth. So as we go through this now, just because we finished up Acts chapter 2, and I kind of left off with this probably challenging thought that we always see the end of Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to, to 47, as the birthing of the church. And I challenged you last week that that might not exactly be true. And again, it says in verse 47 in the Passion Translation, we'll just kind of pick it up where we left off and then go where 
the Spirit of God wants us to go this morning. It says, they were continually filled with praises to God, enjoying favor with all the people. And the Lord kept adding to their numbers daily those that were coming to life. That's how the Passion Translation says it. New King James says, that last part of the verse, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So we automatically look at this and say, oh, this must be the birthing of the church. Look at Holy Spirit fell, Peter preaches, 3,000 get saved, and they were added to the church. But we don't understand the different definitions of the word church. And that's why it gets broken out. Again, in the Passion Translation, it kind of breaks that out for us so we get a better understanding. It says the Aramaic word for church, here in this verse, is the joining of meet and come. This word is an invitation to enter into fellowship with Christ and his people. So when people come to Christ, they don't become part of the church right off. They become part of the body of Christ. And then if they start gathering with a group, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a church. It's a gathering. Or what term I'm going to start to use a lot now, instead of gathering, is oikos. Group of people that get together for a purpose. The Greek word oikos. Now as the Passion Translation expanded, and again, it finished up last week with this, it says the Greek word for church is ekklesia. which is called out ones. See the second footnote on Matthew 16, verse 18. And that's what I put here at the bottom of this, if you follow along in your notes. It says the Greek word for church is ekklesia and means legislative assembly. When people are sitting around the table, fellowshipping, eating, taking communion together, they're not a legislative body. They're a fellowship, which is fine. That's part of the deal. It says, that is you, this term's used, up, oh, sorry, went a little further, or selected ones. This is not a religious term at all, but a political and governmental term. And like I said last week, all the folk that are out there, church and government supposed to be separated. Oh, I can't say that. No, you knew what was going to come out, didn't you? I just do this. That's what the term means. And again, we've got to stop reading scripture in light of our own Western English, United States 2022 terminology and understanding. This is why we have to study to show ourselves the Approved. We have to go in and look, what was he talking about right then? It's not a religious term at all, but a political and governmental term that is used many times in classical Greek for a group of people who have been summoned and gathered together to govern the affairs of the city. Don't you understand? We're supposed to be governing the city. Not the dude in the golden tome. Well, he's supposed to be governing the state, and we know what kind of job he's doing. He ain't never getting my vote again. I'll just make it public right now. <laughs> Ever. Mm-mm. Showed his true colors to me. I don't care what kind of initial he has at the end. R, D, I, P, Q. I don't care. No, you're going to shut down the house of God? Make it illegal to meet? And then backpedal and say you didn't do that? No, you ain't got no integrity. But see, we're supposed to be governing the affairs. We're supposed to be influential. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to be a selectman like I am, but you still need to be influential in the governance of the town because when the righteous are in charge, the city prospers and they're happy. There's a lot of unhappy people out there. Why? Because the devil's kids are in charge. And God didn't design it that way because... Ah, stink. The problem was with us, guys, not literally us, but the church of Jesus Christ doesn't even know what it is, what it's supposed to be, or how it's supposed to function. 
They've not even delved into what we're just talking about now. There's two separate type functions and groups that get together. We want to blend it all in one and there's no power in it. We're going to go through this and we're going to pull it apart and we're going to look at it. It's supposed to be governed in the city. For Jesus to use this term means he is giving the keys of governmental authority in his kingdom to his church. He gave the keys of the kingdom to his church to be the legislative body on this earth. And that brings up so much, so much stuff. We're, we're going to leave it there for now because we'll get into it a little further here later. Not today, but later. So thus is a clear distinction or delineation between a group of people who are inviting people to Christ along with being part of their fellowship versus a called out assembly in a local community that has been formed into an ecclesia for the purpose of exercising kingdom authority in that region, along with equipping the saints and releasing them in order to form more ecclesias. This is the ecclesia Jesus is speaking about in Matthew 16, 18. When Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, he wasn't talking about a gathering. He wasn't talking about an oikos. He was talking about an ecclesia. He equipped those apostles to go out and do this, to build his church. He's going to build it, but he's going to work through them to do it. So we got to keep a lot of these little different pieces, we got to put them all together and get an honest picture of what that's all about. So I want to take a look at these distinctions and characteristics and structures of an oikos and an ecclesia. But I want us to understand right up front, this isn't an exact science because we see some overlapping factors in each. It's not like, okay, Click, cut, oikos, you all just do that. Ecclesia, you all just do that. There's overlapping characteristics, and we're going to understand that, but we've got to understand those overlapping characteristics in light of the overall purpose and function of the structure of an oikos and ecclesia, which we're going to look at as we go through this study on the church. But if you're following in your notes, you see a big, bold, purple thing. It said, arrested by the Holy Spirit. And what that means is he stopped me right here. And he said, before you can go further, and I put this in, before I jump in, I need to remind you of some background history. That the Lord told me to do this back in 2018, 2019. In fact, back in 2018, I believe... Remember, we were hanging around after church and watching a video. Who's the guy's name? Ian? Clayton. Not Clayton. McDonald. Ian McDonald. Is that his name? That's it. McConnell. McConnell on the five-fold ministry, remember? And we're watching it. We watch a little section, and we talk about it. And, and the purpose back then was we were bringing the church into a five-fold ministry-type models and functioning in the office of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. So we were heading that way. That was the whole point, was to align with Scripture. That's kind of important, isn't it, guys? Yeah. That we align with the Scriptures? Because you can't do your own thing and be blessed. God blesses His Word. And we need to function according to the Word. So that's what the Spirit of God was showing me back then, and that's where we were kind of heading. In order to follow the biblical principles of the church structure and governmental authority, but unfortunately, the closer we got to implementing those principles, I faced an unexpected backlash. And in fact, instead of just reading that, I'll just, you know, the proverbial crap hit the fan one night in a board meeting. Because we'd gone through all this, we had already gone through this, and I remember we were all sitting right back here in a circle. And I started the meeting, as I usually do, and said, okay, guys, now that we're at this place, get the teaching in, you know, we all have an understanding, we see it's biblical, how are we going to actually start to implement that was my question. And as soon as I hit that, boom! 
If I told you who this came out of their mouth, you would be shocked. But the person sitting right next to me said, I don't think it's biblical. I went, you've got to be kidding me. Now understand, this person didn't come to me privately. This person didn't come to me privately to ask me questions. This person said this at a board meeting with all the other elders of the church at the time. I don't think it's biblical. Another person jumped in. And another person jumped in. And another person said something. And we went around for about 30 minutes, everybody sharing their views and their differing opinions on the matter. And I just sat there and shut up. Well, I think we need to pray about this. I think we need to pray and fast and separate like they did in Acts 13. And think about this. And I'm like, wow. See, the one saving grace in my life is when I get really upset, I shut up. Which is probably a good thing. <laughs> yep. Honestly. Because I think the thing that bothered me the most was the person who said it and the group agreement when there had been no other kind of talk or conversation as far as I was understanding it. Yep, we see it. It's biblical. We're moving forward. Now we're just at the how and when stage. No, they just chucked it out. And come to find out later, one person in this church was literally undermining me in this. And I think another person on the board was actually doing it too. The other person wasn't on the board that I know was undermining because I did have a sit down with that person and they decided to tell me how I was incorrect. I said, really? See, honestly, and I've said this before and please don't take this rudely, I don't really care what you think. What's the book say? If you can show me in the book where I'm wrong, and you can show me chapter and verse where I'm wrong, I will listen to you. But I don't really care about your interpretation of it, because the Word of God says His Word is not up to private interpretation. You don't get to put your spin on the Word of God. And that's what the church has been doing for a long time now putting its own spin on the structure and design and the purpose of the Word of God to the place that we are of none effect and we are actually a laughing stock in the world today and the world don't give a flip that the church of Jesus Christ even exists because we have no impact and no influence anymore in the world. It's not respected, it's not thought of, it's nothing. To the place where civil authorities can say, you're shut down, and if not, we're putting you in jail. Last I checked, there's a First Amendment that kind of like says you can't do that. But again, when the wicked are in charge, what happens? There's lawlessness. So again, I'm not just standing here ranting and raving on it. I'm trying to really impress upon you where we are at, what really is going on. You know these things I'm saying is true. What are we going to do about it moving forward? So again, now what I find is interesting is not one person from that meeting that night is in this church any longer. Because shortly after that, some left. Some a little after that, some a little after that, and here we are. But what's happened, and, I, and again, that's just background history. That's what happened. So about a month ago, the Holy Spirit began to deal with me about this issue again. In fact, he was none too subtle about it. Did you ever notice that in your life when God really wants to get your attention? He's really none too subtle about it sometimes. You know, we, like, we watch NCIS a lot, and you know the Gibbs head slap? I got the Holy Spirit head slap. And every time he slaps me that way, he knows he's got to give me a scripture. And this is the one he gave me. It's in Luke 6, 46. And we're going to go through Luke 46 through 49, the Passion Translation. 
but I just want to give you 46 here in the King, New King James, because this is how it kind of came across to me. It says this, But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Why are you calling me Lord of your life, and you're not doing what I'm telling you to do? Why? That's a great question. I think he's asking us all that this morning. Why do you call me Lord? Why do you profess me as your Lord, but you don't do what I'm telling you to do? See, in the Passion Translation, it puts it this way. What good does it do for you to say, I am your Lord and Master, if you don't put into practice what I teach you? If you don't put into practice what I teach you, why are you bothering to call me Lord and Master in your life? That's a great question. Why do we do that? Or why, when we hear his teaching or we read it, there's always a yabat or we don't see it that way or that was maybe before, before, but not for now. No, the Spirit of God is saying, why do you call me your Lord and Master if you don't put into practice what I teach you? Now, it doesn't necessarily mean corporate teaching like this all the time, but when you're reading something and it jumps off that page and you go like, ooh, and you get that head slap, why aren't you putting that into practice? Because whoever is Lord of your life is who you will obey. And if you are Lord of your own life, you will do what you want to do in life. And that's what he's saying. Who's really your Lord and Master? Because if it's me, you need to do what I say. And, and I thought it was interesting because as I continue to read the context, it was eerily representative of what he was speaking to me about. Because let me read the rest. Verse 47 says this. Let me describe to you one who truly follows me and does what I say. Now, it is already ought to perk up right there. Let me describe to you one who truly follows me and does what I say. He is like a man who chooses the right place to build a house and then lays a deep and secure foundation. When the storms and floods rage against that house, it continues to stand strong and unshaken through the tempest, for he built it wisely on the right foundation. I think we already heard that word foundation this morning, right? Tired of a sandy one and the sand's been getting cleaned out. Because let's read the rest of the story. But the one who has heard my teaching but doesn't obey it. Oh yeah, you heard it, but you don't obey it. It says, it's like a man who builds a house without laying any foundation at all. It's just sand. When the storms and floods rage against that house, it immediately collapses and becomes a total loss. And then it says this. Very pointed question. The Holy Spirit cut us deep with this question. Which of these two builders will you be? Which of these two builders are you going to be? You're going to build on the solid rock? You're going to build on the firm foundation? Now, I don't know if you've ever done that kind of work, but it ain't easy. Know it's easy? They don't put any foundation at all. They just put it up right where it is. There ain't no digging. There ain't no concrete, no rebob, none of that stuff to make that foundation out of. Nope, just plop it right there. I'm just going to take the easy way out. But that house doesn't stand. And notice, this text can be related to our personal house. As in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, this is in the Living Translation, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? 
Don't you realize your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? Then it says this, you do not belong to yourself. But God brought you with a high price. And you can put in parentheses there, as Peter says, the precious blood of Jesus. He sent his son to die for you so he could have you as his son. Oh, that was good, God. It just kind of rolled out. <laughs> but that's what it was. He sacrificed his son so you could become his son. He says, don't you understand you don't belong to yourself? You had the choice. You were all yours doing whatever you wanted to do until you came to Christ. And once you came to Christ, you now linked up. Your spirit was now welded to his spirit and you became a child of the living God and you no longer can do what you want to do because why? He's now your Lord and Master. It says, so you must honor God with your what? Didn't say your mouth. Didn't say your hands. It says your body. This thing is the temple of the living God. You are responsible for this thing. To take care of this thing and nourish this thing. And be the example of a kingdom saint. I forget where it says, I think it's in... In Ephesians, you uh, may be the only Bible people ever see. It's kind of paraphrasing that text. You are a representative of a child of God. And the first thing people notice even before you open your mouth is the temple that we've created. So in other words, you've got to look the part. There was one thing I was reminded of yesterday, that gentleman that came in. Pretty smart guy. I forget exactly how he phrased it. Do you remember? You've got to be an example of who you are. You know, because obviously we're sitting there, I was talking to him like the select man. He's a town person. Come in, well, what can we do? What do you see? Whatever. He says you need to be I don't think he phrased it this way, but this is what I got. You need to be a better politician. I remember telling him I ain't one. I'm a child of God. He says, yeah, but we need to get a little bit of that there because that's where you're sitting right now. So he says, put your little pinky on the table. <laughs> he says, that's how much you will make. That's how I can do that. But the thing was, you're representing those people that put you there. You need to look the part. And it hit me, Wow. You're right. Now, that doesn't mean I got to wear a three piece suit and all that stuff. But I need to keep in mind who I am. I represent the people that put me there on Tuesday night when I sit in my chair with my little name plaque and we do the business of the town Tuesday night. Guess what? Right now, I represent the King of Kings and Lord of Lords as I stand here and preach to his kids and all those that are watching. You do the same thing when you go out there. You re represent your Lord and your Master. And he said right here, you must honor God with your body. What is your body telling people when they see you? Because the first thing they see is that. Ever before you open your mouth. Your demeanor, the way you carry yourself, the way you treat yourself, dress, all that. And again, it doesn't mean what legalism has made it mean. But I think sometimes we always tend to go to extremes, or at least I do. I swing one way and then the other, and i got to find that balance. Am I ever going to stop wearing jeans and this? Probably not. This is me. I feel more comfortable this way. But can I put a suit on when need be? Sure. And I do a wedding? Guess what? I'm not doing a wedding like this. Why? Because it's a different situation and different representation at that point. 
What are you representing when people see you? Doesn't mean you can't be you, but do you keep that in mind? Because your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And it represents the kingdom from which we come from. And that's not even getting into the behavior and all the other actions and what comes out of our mouth and all that stuff. But the first impression is when you walk into somewhere with people that don't know you, they see this. What is this displaying to them? Because a lot of times we make those judgments, don't we? Go into Walmart this afternoon. I guarantee you'll be making judgments when you look at people. Not critically or maliciously, but that's what we tend to do. So what's your body represent? Not only that, the next thing, this text could also be related to our corporate house. This place. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 says this in the voice translation. Don't you understand that together you form a temple? Together. Collectively, you form a temple to the living God, and His Spirit lives among you. Notice again, now it's not in you, it's among you. Right there, where two or three are gathered. He's there in the midst. He's among us every time we get together. Why? Because corporately, we're His temple, and He shows up to see what's going on. It says, if someone comes along to corrupt, vandalize, and destroy the temple of God, you can be sure that God will see to it that he meets destruction. Because the temple of God is sacred. You together are his temple. This place is sacred to him. We're sacred to him. And anyone that wants to mess with us is messing with him. That's why he says don't touch God's anointed. It's not about you getting all puffed up and getting all excited. No, it, it works that way too, just like we read here. The personal temple and the temple. Don't mess with it. He's well able to take care of it. But again, what this is bringing to my mind is, again, that sacredness, that importance, where are we elevating it in our walk and understanding? Are we taking things for granted? There's another thing that gentleman said yesterday. He says, you know what? We don't just pray and thank God for our meal anymore. Well, he just said, give thanks, because I don't think he believed in God, really. He was good with any God. We'll, we'll get there later, but... I'm not grateful anymore. And that's the thing. We, we've made everything all about us and our feelings and our situation where we're no longer just grateful to say thank you, God. Thank you. I'm alive. I'm functioning. Hey, you know what? We're going to have a great day to get together, God. It's a mindset we have to adapt and work on. And that's why I was reminded of yesterday. Yesterday we went and I wasn't honestly expecting anyone to come. Had no one show up the week before and all of a sudden here, he comes in. Like, thanks God. And then it was more of a session with me. God speaking to me through him. Thank you God. But again, we, this place, this temple represents him. So now what? As you see, now what? So if Yeshua is truly your Lord, then it is incumbent upon you to build your personal temple, your body, in accordance with his teaching, the word of God. Now what? Well, i got to practice the word of God and walk out my salvation with fear and trembling when it comes to the temple in which he lives in because this is the image that I'm portraying to others about who my God is like. So we've got to be cognitive of that. 
And again, you need to let the Spirit of God tell you what that looks like because we all don't look the same. We're not cookie cutters. So again, this has nothing to do with legalism. It has to do with, okay, God, I got it. I'm your temple. How am I to display that in this world in which I live? And again, it begins with an inward attitude. Not so much of what you get on, but it's the inward attitude that radiates out. And if Yeshua is truly our Lord then it is coming upon us to build his temple, his body, in accordance to his teaching, the word of God. So at this point, I said, okay, Lord, I got it. I had it before. I allowed the natural to deter me, because honestly, when that happened, I just backed off. Instead of pushing, I just backed off. Got real spiritual, you know, like we all do, and say, wow, must not be God's timing. <clears throat> no, because anytime you're going to walk in the Word of God and you're going to do what He tells you to do, you're going to face opposition. That's a guarantee. So, no, you don't back off and say, I guess it's not His timing. <laughs> so, then what? Well, what did they do after Peter preached? Peter preached this long thing, long message, and basically said, y'all killed Jesus. It's your fault. Then there's a group of people that spoke up and said, what must we do? That's the first word he said. Repent. Repent, be baptized, receive the gift. So the Spirit of God said, repent. I said, okay. So then he gave me a few other scriptures, which I'm going to read. It says this, in Matthew 7, 21, in the Passion, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into heaven's kingdom. That ought to be an eye-opener for some. Not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, will enter into heaven's kingdom. It is only those who persist in doing the will of my heavenly Father. You have to persist. You have to push through. You have to endure. Isn't that what happened to Peter? Peter was Jesus' right-hand man. Peter got a little puffed up about that. He says, no, before the rooster crows three times, you're going to deny me three times. Nah, I never do that. Really? But what happened? He repented and came back and was restored. And I think that's what we miss in the church today. That peace. Because many times we just want to say, oh, I'm sorry. How'd that work out with Esau and Jacob? Esau lost his birthright. He was sorry. He never repented. There needs to be a persistence. There needs to be an endurance. There needs to not a backing off. There's not a putting your hands to the plow, as I think it also says in Luke, and then stopping and looking back. Looking back can be good to see what you did, to say, no, I repent, and I'm not going to do that again, and move forward. In Proverbs 3, 11 and 12, it says in the Living Bible, it says this, young man, do not resent it when God chastises and corrects you. To me, that's the head slap. For his punishment is proof of his love. See, we've been taught punishment is proof of our failure. No. Punishment is proof of his love. Just as a father punishes a son, he delights in to make him better. 
That's what we did when correcting our children growing up. We wanted to make them better. We didn't want them to keep making the same mistakes over and over, which would cause them harm and grief in the long run. No, it's to make you better. So the Lord corrects you. He corrects you to make you better. He corrects you to keep you on the straight and narrow. He wants you to be blessed. He doesn't want you sowing seed out on the fringes and you reaping this harvest of sickness and disease and poverty and all this stuff along the way and destruction in your life because you're erring off on the side. No, he's going to correct you to bring you back in. Why? Because he loves you and wants the best for you. Revelation 3.19 in the Amplified says this, those whom I dearly and tenderly love, I tell their faults and convict and convince and reprove and chasten. In the brackets it says, I discipline and instruct them. That's what correction is. I discipline and instruct. I'm not going to tell you did wrong without telling you how to do right. He goes on and says, so he enthusiastic and is earnest and burning with zeal and repent. Changing their mind and attitude. Okay, sounds good. But do we get a guarantee about that? Yeah. 1 John 1, 9 in the Amplified says this too. If we freely admit that we have sinned and confessed our sin, he is faithful and just, true to his own nature and nature and promises, and will forgive our sins, dismiss our lawlessness. Do you know that that's what sin is? It's lawlessness. It's going rogue. That's what sin is. We see a lot of that today in the upper governments, going rogue, kind of doing their own thing. It's pretty bad when the government's got to get taken to court because they don't even know the laws and they're breaking them too. You're the government. You made them. You are the law-making body of laws and you're not even upholding the laws that you made. That's how lawless things have gotten. Well, it's the same with us in the spirit. When we go rogue, we're lawless. And continually cleanse us from all unrighteousness, everything not in conformity to his will in purpose, thought, and action. So basically he says this, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, because a lot of times we just go and we say, okay, yeah, I messed up, let's just move on. But there's no repentance. And you know how there's no repentance? is because sometime down the road, you mess up again, do the same thing again. You never really changed your mind. That's what repentance is. Changing your mind. Going in a different direction. Saying, okay, the next time I hit opposition, I'm not backing off. I'm going through. I'm going to persist. I'm going to endure. Because you know what, God? You need to be the Lord because you said, if you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I tell you to do, what's the point? How often do we do that? And then we function in lawlessness. And then we're sowing all the negative seed. And then we're getting all this bad harvest. And we're wondering what's going on in our lives. That's it. So again, just like when we come to Christ, we must repent. We must understand that we're a sinner and we can't get to heaven on our own no matter what we do. That's why Peter said... What's the first thing you got to do, guys? You got to repent. You got to change your mind, attitude, thought patterns. We don't repent. So if you know you got an issue in your life, like we heard earlier, just for an example, because we heard that, okay, if you're saying things you don't want to be saying anymore, you got to repent. And when that tries to well back up, because guess what? It will. Because a lot of what's in our life is a habit, you have to stop it right then and there and say, no, I'm not going there. That's repenting. You've changed your mind. You can't all of a sudden just let it fly again because there was no real repentance there. Because when you repent, it stops. That's how you know you really repented. When you say, no, God, I don't want that anymore. 
No, God, if you take this drinking thing away from me, I will serve you the rest of my life. And when the most dramatic tragedy of my life ever happened and that thought came to my mind, I knew I had repented. Why? I didn't go do it. There was a true change that occurred. But it doesn't happen until repentance happens. Repentance isn't just saying you're sorry. Repentance is saying, Lord, never doing that again. Because you are my Lord. And I messed that up. You know what, Lord? At that time, when I backed off, I was thinking more about me than I was thinking about you. I didn't want to deal with the backlash. I didn't want to deal with the hassle. It, it's easier. We've learned in this realm, and the enemy knows that, is to avoid conflict. That's why folk are walking around putting that thing on. I'm going to avoid conflict. Now again, that's personal with you. I don't care. But through this whole thing, I only wore this thing once, was because I had to bring my child into the hospital for an operation. And I wore it all of two minutes just to get past the person who told me how to wear it. Or else they weren't letting me in. But after that, I was hanging off my ear. It was. She was there. When I came back to get her, I didn't even argue with the first person again. They zapped me in my head, gave me one. I put it on, walked right around the corner into the bathroom, put my bandana on, and went and got her. No. Not doing it. No. He's my Lord. He's my protector. He's my all in all. Now that's just an example of when I obeyed what I felt he wanted me to do. But I messed up that one. So now what I'm going to do is repent. Before his temple. And then what we'll do is, like we said, if he has been speaking to you this morning, there's just something you want to repent of. Feel free to do it. When I get done, if there's something you want to share, we'll just give a minute or so. And But again, repentance is a missing whatever in the body of Christ today. I told you back when I got saved in the early 80s, went to this old country Baptist church, man, there was somebody always repenting on a Sunday morning. Just stand up in front of everybody. The crowd wasn't no bigger than this. Most of the time smaller. Just repenting. And I want y'all to know I really screwed up this week. I mean, there was no stigma with it. There was no whatever. They understood that when I repent, I can move forward now. It's not just saying, oh, I'm sorry and, and, and whatever. No, repentance is different. You're going to change your mind. Change your attitude. So Lord, right now, I come before you, Father, and I repent. I repent of backing off of what you told me to do back in 2018, 2019. I mean, I did what you told me to do. I taught about it. I instructed on it. But when we get to that place of actually doing it and face that opposition instead of pushing through, knowing that this is what you placed on my heart, other people knew but again, there was that. The enemy got in. Sowing seed. Because it's those little foxes that spoil the vine. And Lord, I'm not just, I'm not blaming at all. But as you reminded me of these things now, I need to be the leader you called me to be in this place, to stand up in the position that you placed me in because I certainly didn't ask for this position. It was in response to the call you placed upon my life and the direction in which you were sending me. And as I heard yesterday, a key truth, I needed to be the general on the hill at the time. So Lord, forgive me, I repent for not being that general, for not being that leader for not following what you told me to do, no matter what I was seeing and experiencing in the natural. 
And Lord, that's not going to happen anymore. Because I'm going to truly repent right now. Because, Father, as we sung this morning, this truly is all about you. Certainly not about me. It's not about those that sit in these seats right now, those that are going to sit in these seats in the future. As you build your church, because we're going to found it and structure it the way you told us to do. Because, Lord, I found it interesting over all these years how people are always pointing fingers and blame about the growth. Where is it? How come people come and go? And, Lord, that falls on my shoulders, and I repent because I've not built this the way you instructed so that you could build upon it. Because, Lord, there was no foundation. You never built the church on the foundation of a pastor. You built the foundation on the apostle and the prophet, with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. So Lord, now as we go forward and we go against that grain, so to speak, and we, we instruct again and teach again on that, Father, give us revelation. Give us understanding by your Spirit to see the truth of the matter that this place will no longer be built on sand. But Father, we will become a people, not just personally, but corporately, that will do what you've told us to do. And then we can boldly proclaim that you are our Lord. Because we will follow the teachings that you are teaching us. So Lord, I honor you and I praise you and I worship you now. And Father, I claim 1 John 1, 9. Lord, I have confessed my sins and I thank you that you are faithful and you are just to forgive me of that and to cleanse me of that unrighteousness that I may now move forward to truly walk in the position you've called me, the office you've called me. And to do corporately in this place what you've said by your word. Because, Lord, you said we can't add to or take away from your word. We can't be of private interpretation of your word. But, Lord, in order to do this, we need to see what we saw at the end of Acts 2, that they were all in one accord. That there was an understanding. Because the enemy is obviously going to try to come in and bring misunderstanding and disinformation and all kinds of stuff like we see going on in the world today. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus I stand against that now. That you put a hedge around your temple. That you put a hedge around us. That we would only hear what the Spirit of God has to say. That we would truly have discernment and understanding as we move forward. Because, Lord, the time is short. The fields are white under harvest. You've clearly told us to go into all the world, make disciples, baptize them, and teach them. And then you told us to be a governing authority and, and to equip the saints and send them out that we may infiltrate this world with the gospel. And Lord, we're not going to do it the way men have decided to structure things today. May we, once again, become people of the pure Word of God, unadulterated. And yes, there's different revelations, Lord, but there's only one truth. And your Word is true. So, Father, I thank you and honor you and worship you. I look forward to what you will do in this place. Because this place is truly going to become that church that Jesus said that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Honor you and worship and praise you now in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Why don't you shut that down now so...